focus on identifying common soybean insects pests in Africa and quantifying economic thresholds for insect pest damage. We will be hearing from two experts today and we'll get started with our speaker, Dr. Doris Lagos Kurtz in, in just a few minutes. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Soybean Innovation Labs webinar series on scouting, identification and management of soybean pests in Africa. My name is Dr. Harun Murithi and I am the sales plant pathology expert. I'll be serving as a moderator for today's webinar. This webinar is the first in our two part series on identification and management of soybean insects pests in Africa. And today's webinar focuses on welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on identifying common soybean insect pests in Africa and quantifying economic thresholds for insect pest damage. And you'll we'll be hearing from two experts in the field of soybean insect pest identification and management. So the goal of today's webinar is to increase our knowledge of the most economically important soybean insect pest in Africa and provide you with the tools to effectively identify them. In addition, you will learn about the evaluation skills for, uh, to de for, uh, for determining pest damage, economic injury level, EAIL, and the economic threshold to help you decide when to act to control the insect pests. We will be hearing from two experts today who will be presenting their experiences from many years of research on soybean insect pests, identification and management. We will follow the presentations with our Q&A session. So please add your questions to the chat feature as we go and we will discuss them at the end. We will also have a few quick polls during the webinar to understand how and who is joining us today and our attendees knowledge of soybean insect pests. This webinar is being recorded, so you can rewatch it at any time on your YouTube channel. Registered guests will receive the PDFs of the presentations, as well as an additional material given from each expert on soybean insect pests. And so before we get started, we would like to get some more information on who is joining us today. So please answer the following question, uh, following poll question that will appear on your screen screen in just a moment.
So the poll question is, which region are you joining us from? Alini, have you posted the poll question? So it's great to see so many folks joining us from all over the world today. And it looks like we have a big number of people from across uh, uh, the continent. And so now we would also like to get a better uh, of your experience level for correctly identifying insect pests in soybean. And so I will request that we launch uh, poll two. All right, so I wanted to find out uh, how confident you are in identifying the soybean pest in the field. Um, so we, well, it's, um, it's a great wide of response that, that we get. And today we look forward to learning more about how to identify different pests of soybean and, um, and how to um, look at how the damage the costs on, on soybeans and how to estimate that to make a decision uh, for managing the, the disease. And so uh, without uh, taking a lot of time, I want now to invite our first speaker. And so our first speaker is Doris Katz Legos. She received a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign and worked as a postdoc under the supervision of Glenn Hartman. So Dr. Lagos is currently a USDA employee and serves as the insect taxonomist of the US Midwest Sanction Trap Network. She has conducted research on soybean plant resistance, screening against soybean aphids and soybean thrips, which are vectors of soybean vein necrosis virus. So today, Dr. Lagos will, be, uh, will help us in the, uh, understanding the identification and life cycle of several important soybean insect pests, including stink bugs, leaf miners, and stem borers. So I will turn it over uh, to, to Doris so that she can um, take us through the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Harun, for the invitation and also the Soybean Innovation Lab for the big effort on making this happen. Um, well, uh, yes, I'm gonna talk to you about the uh, soybean insect pest, and, but first I would like to uh, introduce or talk to you about the basic of entomology. Now, uh, we usually want to jump far before we do baby steps. Uh, for this, I would like to talk to you about what is an entomology and is the study of insects. And entomology has many branches, branches that are all gonna help on crop protection or the ones that are, are marked in yellow on my slide. Um, they are the ones that are very much related 
to crop protection entomology. And what is crop protection entomology is the, the way to manage resources to reduce yield on agricultural crops. And so with that, we have this big uh, field, which is the integrated pest management. Integra integrated uh, pest management is the mix of knowledge of what is um, to know about the insect pests and how to control them and to manage the pest damage in a, in a, in a safely and economically way. Um, with that being said, I would like to uh, let you know that my field is the insect systematics, which involve morphology, taxonomy, which is classification, and the big resource, which is molecular, and at least DNA barcoding, because uh, molecular work has been so helpful on especially identifying new uh, aphids. And for example, in my case, I studied the group of uh, aphids, like soybean aphids, cotton mellow aphids, that big genus is, genus is very complex. And the way that I use is, for example, some genes that uh, uh, have been used that, for example, called cotton melon aphid has really uh, had big development on resistance to insecticides. So uh, that helps to identify, in, in my case, in the midways for new aphid species. And like I said, I want to wrap it up. This is like by saying that accurate identification is the key for insect pest management. With that, I want to continue with basic knowledge of entomology and the life cycle of insects, because that is going to help you to where to look for insects and how they live and how, you know, the, for example, the metamorphosis, what, what kind of life cycle they have. In the, in the case of sting bugs or broad headed bugs or, or aphids or millibugs, so they, they have this incomplete metamorphosis, which after they hatch from eggs, they look kind of like the adult, adult uh, morphs. But um, in the mouth part, they are modified. They are elongated, uh, typically uh, tubular, and flexible. And so I added the head of, of grasshopper here because despite that they have a different mouth part, um, they have um, incomplete metamorphosis. Okay, so continuing with uh, uh, insects that have incomplete metamorphosis, I want to start with aphids. And so they are plant feeders, they suck the juice of the plants. And I, I, in the bottom of my slides, uh, I presented the soybean aphids, which uh, a few years ago have been a really uh, big problem for soybean crop production in USA and Canada. And so, how these tiny, pretty aphids, you know, uh, they look so cute, but uh, when they, which in, in good conditions, which are about 25 degrees Celsius, they, they develop fast. And then they, because they produce uh, mildew or sugar waste, uh, they ended up developing other plants and mold, which you see progressively how the, the, the leaves die and in, in the, the, this consequently yield to uh, 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 production losses. And so with that, in 2019, Dr. Harman brought aphids to me and, and ethanol, and they were so tiny, hardly, really hardly see to, to see them. But he said he found them in uh, soybean, but not like in great num numbers like soybean aphids, just like about seven to 10 per leaf leaflet. And so, um, since to, uh, you know, molecular work, uh, DNA extractions, I could figure out which aphid it was. And he found this aphid in Pongui, uh, Zambia. 
continue, um, I want to go with this uh, insect pest, broad-headed bug and mealybugs. They haven't been uh, cited as a, as a threat for soybeans, but when they feed on soybeans, the broad-headed bug can damage the seeds and reduce viability of them. And also the mealybugs, they look in the plants like it, cotton balls, but if you look closer, they are, they like the, 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 the juice, if they like the juice of the plants, they develop in big juicy insect balls. Okay, so the next one are the steam bugs. They um, are really big problem, not because, I mean, you know, here I'm just showing you USA resources, all the information that I have here, but they are no problem in the quantity. They are more a problem in seed quality. And as you see in pots, they produce this type of damage because the, the proboscis of the hypodermic estillate that they have inject toxins, the saliva that is toxic to the leaf tissues and they ended up dying. And so when you open pots, for example, you can see these bad uh, uh, seeds damaged by steam bugs. And the most common we have here in USA, green steam bag, and also I, I read that are, you know, cited in Africa. <clears throat> and also I mentioned to you about the, the life cycle that the um, immatures more look like at the adults. Well, in this in this case, they don't look much alike, but they are usually sting bugs look like a, uh, to me like a American football players, you know, with these big shoulders. <coughs> so, I'm going to share also my experience working with sting bugs and host plant resistance. I developed a non-choice test. Um, to figure out what, you know, at early stage, what uh, plant introduction got affected. And I, I selected an array of uh, um, soybean uh, based on in past studies in uh, soybean resistance. And so I found a PI that showed resistance to the sting bug feeding, which is the PI 60. 4464. And as you notice, when the steam bag feed on the plant, the tips of the plant where the steam bag feed, it dies. And also, I want to share slides of the how I rare them, how I rare, rare the steam bags in the lab. And so, uh, usually, they like to, to lay eggs on the soybean leaves under and the other side, underside. And but because the plants died, and I usually use Williams 82, uh, I added additional resource, resource of food for them, like a raw peanut and carrots. Okay, the next one, um, continue with showing you the type of life cycles. So here we have a, a, a different set of insects, which are mostly beetles, mostly beetles, uh, moths, um, flies. Uh, so they have a complete metamorphosis. What it is that they, they most of these uh, uh, beetles or moths, they like to lay eggs on the ground and then most of them, the, the larvae develop in the ground and then they, the, they go to a pupae and then they develop to adult. And so, not all of them, and I want to introduce here this slide or this pic of uh, the lady beetle, which is a great predator for aphids and they don't go to the ground. Talking about beetles, um, I want to start with the blister beetles. They are uh, major defoliators. And we have many species here in USA and as well as in Africa. Um, they are very interesting because they lay, lay eggs on the ground and the larvae are predators of uh, eggs, uh, grasshoppers eggs. In addition, they are 
uh, cause problems is when they bite to human skin. They they uh, the reaction is this blister that you see in the uh, slide. I also uh, want to talk about the gourd gourd uh, beetle. These beetles are uh, can damage. Let's see on my notes. So they can cause damage, cause damage about 60% of yield uh, losses. And so what they do, the females, adults, they produce some damage in the stems of course, girls, it's hard to pronounce. Uh, but then those are the ways that they, the, the, the adult female lay eggs. And then this area diet, and when the larvae hatch in much, Manage its way to go into the stem and produce, uh, you know, these uh, tunnels in the stems, and that's how the larva develop. And then they go to pupae, go to the soil, and then the adult comes out. So I just want for you to watch out for this type of damage. Um, continue with brookids or weevils. <laughs> They are a problem in the storage process. So uh, these brookids are uh, actually. I just want to share with you this uh, with you this this pic, which I love, and I uh, we work with Michelle and the group in 2019 to identify what kind of brook brookit it was. Uh, but you know, we could see how the damage looked. Like, and so what happened is these beetles take uh, a chance when uh, late harvest is uh, conducted. So these are those beetles, which also I want to mention that the big success for this pest is because they, uh, they have multiple host plants. So in addition of feeding on soybean, they also feed on other leg legumes and other uh, host plants families. So the adults lay eggs on the seeds, look at these tiny little white spots in the seeds. And then the larvae manage to get into the seed and make these tunnels empty. You know, they, they get all juicy and pretty after feeding on seeds. And then they make a holes for the adult to come out. And that's the process of how they develop so fast in storage in, in storage rooms that you know become a really big problem. So now I'm gonna talk to you about the uh, loopers or moth defoliators. And so we have many in, uh, uh, they have been cited in USA, and as well I know that they are they are spread in Africa. And so I found these facts about these uh, defoliators or how to identify them. And it's basically on the, uh, the abdominal prolegs. So the true legs are in the front, as you see in the big picture of, of the soybean looper and the other worms. But the abdominal uh, prolegs are the ones that have been used to identify the larvae in the field because they, as you see, they kind of look alike. So the soybean looper has two abdominal prolegs. The green clover worm has three abdominal prolegs and the velvet bean caterpillar has four. And so these defoliators, uh, you know, if you don't uh, evaluate your fields, if you see a damage up to 35%, so that's when it, it's time to, it's a red flag for, to start looking for, uh, uh, chemical control or other type of control to be used. So continue with moth, uh, we have these uh, bean leaf webworm or soybean leaf folder in the ground uh, nut leaf miner. Yeah, I think this ground nut uh, leaf miner causes about 40 
percent, 40, 60 percent of dimension fields when they are present. But uh, the main problem is because they reduce the photosynthetic area of the um, plants, which are the leaves, because they roll it, they stick them together, they feed on them. So um, they are very, you know, when you're in the field, they are very easy to identify, see these uh, uh, leaves stick to each other. And so, um, and they are usually present throughout the phenology of soybean. Continue with moth, I want to uh, talk about pink pot border or cow PC moth. Um, this can cause about 90% of geo losses. And these tiny hot pink larvae usually are laid uh, by the um, females, adults under the uh, epidermis of the leaf tissues. And also, um, close to the pedicels of the leaves or petioles, where the larvae manage to go to the pods and they can, they feed on seed and you look and see the, the, the damage on the seeds. And like I say, they are problem, not only in the storage, but also from sowing to harvesting. Um, now I want to talk about fly. These uh, flies are Lepidoptera, and uh, they also have a complete metamorphosis. And so these uh, Melanogromisa soji can cause about 40% of damage in soybean fields. And so what happened, these uh, flies, they uh, lay eggs under the so under the epidermis of leaves, and then the the maggots or the larvae, it managed to to go uh, uh, to the stem and get in and, and, and start feeding into it. And then you see this damage kind of close to the pink pot or to the uh, uh, to the other uh, board. Uh, let me talk about. Put like the other beetle that I talk about that feeds on, on, on the stems. So these uh, flies compared to, to the other uh, insects, they like rainfall, they like humid weather. Um, My last slide, I want to talk about spider mites. Spider mites usually are not a problem. And usually when people see it, they are fields and they see bad spots, maybe charcoal rot uh, damage. But you, when you see the sun blasted uh, leaves, when you, you turn those leaves, you can uh, see those tiny little reds or white, uh, mites walking and making these spider webs. And, though, and then you can see the, the damage on the field with the, the producing the leaf decay and die. But, and also it has been mentioned that they prefer ages, soybean field ages. Why? Because uh, especially they are problem when they are um, drought years, you know, and also when people control the weeds with insecticides. So usually weeds are the ones that are preferred for these uh, mites. And also they are not prone because they, they have big predators as well, like in mites, white mites. Uh, with that, I want to thank uh, the USDA and the Innovation Lab and the whole group of people that have been working the past years. And so, thank you. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Doris, for that fascinating presentation. So it's actually essential for us as farmers, researchers, and extension agents to be able to correctly identify soybean insect pests in the field and know which 
insect life cycles cause the most damage. So uh, we want to request, if you have any questions for Doris, please type them in the chat and we will get to them during the Q&A session. So next we will be hearing from Dr. Louise Hessler, a research entomologist for the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Brookings, South Dakota, USA. So Dr. Louise uh, is current, currently serves as the lead scientist there and also acting as the research leader at the Sunflower and Plant Biology Research Unit in Fargo, North Dakota. Dr. Hessler's research has centered on the management of insects in field crops such as soybean, corn, wheat, and rice. And his individual and collaborative research has evaluated resistant varieties, planting dates, and crop maturity including cover crops, seed treatments, foliar sprays, and tillage for managing insect pests. So I would request uh, Luis to just turn on um, his camera and uh, you can go ahead and make uh, the presentation on the, uh, the damages and how to estimate the uh, thresholds for pests uh, insect damage. Okay, let me get this going here. Great. Is that working, Haroon? Can you see the title slide? Yes, I can see. Okay, very good. All right. Good day, everyone. Some some good morning, some good afternoon. Uh, pleasure to be here. As Haroon said, uh, I'm going to discuss evaluation scales economic injury level and economic threshold for soybean pests. Um, as I get started, as I get started, I'd like to first uh, make some acknowledgements, uh, first of all, to the Soybean Innovation Lab for hosting the webinar series, and then to uh, Haroon for serving as a moderator and for inviting me to make this presentation today. And also, I have some colleagues that uh, have been associated with USDA. This is uh, Roy Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott is the leader of national programs and has responsibility for soybeans. So I have a lot of discussions with Dr. Um, Scott. Also, uh, Glenn Hartman, who's retired as the um, acting research as the research leader, and then Doris Lagos Coots, both were um, um, in, uh, from Urbana, Illinois, and then also Eric Beckendorf, my technician, who has extensive uh, done extensive work on um, soybean pests, including some uh, the early work on soybean aphid in North America. So again, thanks thanks for inviting me to present. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, various topics today. First, we'll uh, delve into direct and indirect pest damage relationships. We'll move on and discuss the three E's of IPM. Then we'll progress to talk about the concepts that underlie IPM. These will be things such as the gain threshold, economic injury level, economic threshold, and sampling. And then we'll have some fun at the end and discuss some uh, exercises for review and application of um, what we've uh, learned today. Um, also need to make some disclaimers before I actually get into my presentation. This presentation will provide basic concepts behind IPM. Some of the concepts have been simplified for this presentation. Examples would be um, injury and damage. I'm gonna use those interchangeably and basically equivalent, equivalently throughout this presentation. Um, there are some um, subtle differences between those that are used in relation to um, things such as um, insect pest management. And then um, the pest, and damage relationships that I'll be discussing today are portrayed fairly simply as linear and deterministic, uh, whereas in reality, many are complex and have stochastic uh, uh, equations that can describe those relationships. Um, attendees are encouraged to consult the suggested reading materials associated with this webinar for more in-depth information. Uh, and then finally, mention of trade names or articles in this presentation is for information's sake and does not constitute an official endorsement or approval by USDA, and USDA is an equal opportunity provider and employer. 
Okay, so with that, let's get started um, discussing some of the topics for today. First is direct and indirect damage by pests. And what do we mean by that? Well, by direct damage, we're talking about the pest inflicts damage to tissue that is responsible directly for yield loss. These would be things like pod and fruit feeders that cause direct damage, direct seed, seed yield loss and fruit loss. It could also apply to leaf feeders when the product or yield that we're after has to do with forage or leafy vegetables. Root feeders directly in, uh, in, in uh, impact roots when things such as tubers are being har are the harvestable product and therefore there's yield loss in terms of tuber loss. Then we can also have indirect pests. And in this case, even though sometimes leaf feeders may be direct pests, in some instances they'll be indirect pests where they do not harm the uh, harvestable product directly, but they're more in involved with reducing photosynthesis. Same with root feeders. If, they're, if the harvestable product is not a root or a tuber, then root feeders can disrupt water and nutrient uptake and thereby cause loss to the harvestable yield product. And finally, we have things like stem borers, some of which um, Doris had talked about in her presentation. And these may cause plant lodging and make uh, the plants and, and the, the crop unharvestable. They don't directly uh, affect yield, but altogether these things such as leaf feeders, root feeders, stem borers can cause indirect yield loss. Okay, and then next we can also consider the measurement of pest severity and talk about that as well in terms of direct and indirect uh, categories. If we're talking about a direct measurement of pest severity, we might be talking about abundant sampling of those insects. This, this would be typically insect counts. This could be the number of insects per plant or number of insects per area, number per sweep. And we could also uh, measure pest severity indirectly in terms of damage assessment. What kind of damage is that pest causing? For instance, we could measure some things or estimate the percentage defoliation. We could conduct stand counts. For example, we could see if there's a reduction in the seedlings per meter of row that's been caused by a particular uh, pests such as a cutworm or a wireworm. On the right here, you have an example of some um, damage, uh, defoliation caused by a Japanese beetle shown in the center of that picture. Um, it's starting to cause some fairly good, fairly heavy defoliation in the upper leaves of these soybean plants. Um, we could either sample for the beetles in order to estimate pest severity, or we could try to estimate the amount of defoliation is a damage assessment and uh, measurement of pest severity. These are important in determining um, how much pest damage there is, how many pests there are, and what the potential is for yield loss in the soybean crop. Okay, we're gonna move on to the uh, second topic here, and that's the three E's of IPM. Of course, IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. And this is uh, reducing pest losses in ways that are effective, economically sound, and ecologically compatible. What do we, let's flesh that out a little bit, and discuss each one of those three E's uh, individually. So what do we mean? What do we mean by those? Well, when we talk about Effective, we mean that the, uh, that the pest management action that we take, whether it's an application of pesticides or whatever, is timed right with an efficacious management tactic. We don't want to apply too early or too late. We need to know um, when to apply that, ap uh, that application in order for it to be um, effective against the pest. A second E of the IPM is economically sound. That is the cost of the tactic is appropriate to the value of the crop. Um, we need to apply the most effective tactic at the best price. The farmer is there to make money. He has to balance uh, making money between saving yield and the cost of uh, intervention with a pest management tactic in order to preserve that yield. And then finally, um, 
IPM needs to be ecologically compatible and the tactic must consider the preservation of beneficial insects and human health. For example, spraying at the wrong time can cost the farmer for an ineffective application. He might need to spray again. The more frequently we spray, the more pressure we put on pest populations to develop resistance. Um, if we're spraying frequently, we're probably uh, knocking out um, some of our natural enemies that we're relying upon to actually help us with uh, natural pest control. And we're also uh, putting some things such as bees and other pollinators at risk. So we need to make sure that IPM is ecologically compatible. Okay, next we're gonna relate pest abundance to yield loss. And so uh, what we have here is a graph with yield loss on the y-axis or left-hand side, and then pest abundance uh, on the bottom scale, the bottom graph, the x-axis, and we have pest abundance increasing from from uh, left to right on that scale and yield uh, on the, on the y-axis. So when scouting, some level of insects and their damage will always be observed in a, in a soybean field. However, in many situations, those pests are at low levels and will not cause yield loss. If you look at the um, bottom right corner of that graph, you'll see that there's no loss. There's a certain low level of pest abundance that is not going to cause um, any yield loss in soybean. Um, the plant has the ability to tolerate or compensate for that damage. And so certainly we wouldn't want to spray um, at, at any of those levels because this, the, the plant is, is not going to suffer yield loss. But as pest abundance increases, um, we see that uh, yield loss can also increase. And that's depicted by the yellow line uh, that goes there until a point where the pest abundance can become so severe that it's, it's essentially robbed the plant of all the yield and there can be no more yield loss. So there's a maximum yield loss that can be achieved um, once the pest abundance re reaches a certain um, high level. And then one of the concepts um, I'm gonna associate with yield loss and pest abundance is, uh, uh, and, and some of the actions we take uh, to manage those pests is something called the gain threshold gain threshold or GT. Basically the gain threshold is defined by this um, simple ratio here or equation. And it's basically the cost of a chemical uh, and the cost to apply that chemical in terms of dollars or denaires or shillings per hectare um, in relation to the soybean market value. What is the price of or that soybeans are selling for in terms of dollars per kilogram? And when you take the ratio of those two, dollars per hectare and dollars per kilogram, you come out with a um, result or product that is expressed in terms of kilograms per hectare. So the gain threshold is basically a measure of yield, essentially, that relates the cost of a pest management application to um, soybean market value. So, just to flesh this out a little bit more, again, gain threshold is a ratio that's in terms of kilograms per hectare. And for example, you see at the bottom there, if the gain threshold was five kilograms per hectare, then an insecticide application would need to, need to save the farmer at least five kilograms per hectare for that application to be profitable. So just because we see pests in the field and we feel like they're causing some kind of damage and perhaps even yield loss, there's a certain point at which um, we, we must consider whether that's profitable and that that's often defined in terms of the gain threshold. And then one other measure that's tied to the gain threshold, and that is shown in this, in the bottom of this slide, and that's the economic injury level. So the economic injury level or EIL, sometimes called the economic damage level, is the minimum number of insects or amount of damage that's required to reduce yield equal to the gain threshold. What exactly do we mean by this relationship between um, the gain threshold and the EIL? And that's shown in this uh, graph here, which is similar to the one I showed a few slides back, in which we have yield loss again on the y-axis and pest abundance or damage uh, on the x-axis. And you can see that the gain threshold and the EIL are related. So there's a, there's a certain level of pest abundance 
called the EIL, in which we would take action because the gain threshold or that savings to the farmer in terms of the kilograms per hectare of yield would justify um, taking that, that pest management action. Okay, a second concept um, associated with the economics of pest management is something called the economic threshold, ET. It's sometimes called an action threshold. And it's the level at which an increasing pest um, infestation needs to be controlled to keep it at or below the EIL. You can see on this graph that the EI, that the ET comes uh, at a at a pest abundance or a pest damage that is less than the EIL, and, and it will come sooner. It will appear sooner because um, it's it's simply less pest abundance. So the uh, the EIL is always going to be greater than the economic threshold. Why is that? Well, that's to give some lead time in order to uh, before we reach the economic injury level where damage is going to exceed. Um, the cost uh, to control that control that damage or that pest infestation. So we need time to uh, when we reach the economic threshold. That's basically giving us time in order to uh, save the plant from reaching um, the crop from each reaching the economic injury level. Lead time is usually uh, is just a few days, and you want to give yourself that kind of time in order to take a pest management action, whether it be a chemical spray or microbial spray or whatever action. Um, you know, we can have rain. We may not be able to get into the field and apply the, the pesticide. Um, the pesticide may not be available. There are other um, considerations in the workload of a farmer, and, and they may not be able to get to the field to take care of that pest problem um, in time. So when we reach the economic threshold, we know that that pest problem is going to need to be dealt with, but it gives us uh, days, kind of gives the farmer days, uh, a little lead time in which um, to get ready and take action um, to solve that pest problem before it reaches the, the economic injury level or EIL. Okay, the question then would become how do we set an EIL and an ET for a soybean pest? Well, there's a couple of basic things that we need to know. We need to know, first of all, the relationship between yield loss and the number of pest insects per area uh, in order to develop the EIL. If you look at the um, white uh, box at the bottom right of this graph, of uh, this slide, you'll see that we have a graph there that depicts yield on the left on the y-axis and then the number of insects per area. And that relationship needs to be established um, in order to develop the EIL. We need to know how tight the fit of that line is between insects per area and yield, yield loss and how steep that line is. Then we can begin to uh, think about when does that, um, how, how quickly does that pest develop and what kind of yield loss is it, is it causing? And so that brings me to the second point, which we also need to know the rate of pest population development. And this, this can get us from the ET or economic threshold uh, and give us that lead time. To know, we'll know then what that lead time is to get from the economic threshold to the um, economic injury level. So two basic things we need to know there is the relationship between yield loss and pest density or pest per area, and then the rate of pest population development. Okay, so in the real world, how do we set an EIL and an ET for a soybean pest? Well, I, I worked with a colleague named Mike Katangi, who was formerly uh, associated with South Dakota State University here, and he said economic injury levels and action levels or economic thresholds are actually quantified through slow, tedious, and unglamorous uh, research. And that's, that's true. Um, you don't just quickly uh, determine in economic injury levels and action levels. It takes uh, usually a couple of years of uh, really good hard research in order to establish those economic entry levels and economic thresholds for uh, a pest in soybean. And because of that, we find that many crops do not have established EILs, or if they do, 
those were established many years ago and the, the, the varieties have changed, the cultivars have changed, maybe some of the planting practices have changed, maybe the pest has, uh, has become more severe, uh, perhaps uh, more difficult to manage. And by the same token, most crops do not have calculated economic thresholds or ETs, or if they do, these also were set uh, many years ago. So in, in many instances, um, we don't have a, a really good economic injury level or an economic threshold. We, 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 we may have an idea of when to spray for a pest based on some damage and experience, and these are called nominal thresholds. But there's uh, opportunities and need out there for a lot of uh, research to develop accurate economic injury levels and to accurately calculate um, the economic thresholds that are associated with those injury levels. So in your particular region, there may be opportunities for grants and for research, and uh, you may be able to play a part in developing economic injury levels uh, and economic thresholds for particular pests in your area, and especially if some of those pests are new, uh, newly introduced into your area, or for some reason in recent years have become a pest, whereas in past years, maybe they weren't really considered much of a pest at all. So opportunities out there to, to establish these EILs and ETs. Okay, and then finally, we need a robust sampling plan um, to go along with the EIL and the ET. We need these sampling plans to know with confidence whether the pests are at the economic threshold or not, and whether we need to take action. So good sampling plans are important in order to use ETs and IPM effectively. And just as with the EILs and the ETs, research is also needed um, to develop effective sampling plans for the particular pest um, that we're interested in. Okay, with those topics that we've covered, I'd like to uh, just pause now and say that we're gonna have a little review uh, to try to uh, cement some of the concepts that I've just presented. And so we'll review those and apply some of the concepts to some scenarios in the next, um, in the following few slides. Okay, scenario number one involves the pink pod borer, which is a uh, moth pest or that's native to India. And it's been re recently introduced, recently discovered damaging soybeans in parts of Africa since 2021. The female moths lay their eggs on developing soybean plants and the distinct pink larvae enter uh, maturing soybean pods and boreholes in the maturing seeds causing discoloration and shrinkage, shrinkage and can cause drastic reductions in yield. So based on some of the information I'd given you earlier, which bits of those, that information do you need to know to develop an EIL for soybean pink pod borer in your region? I've given you five choices there. Um, A, the EIL that's used in India where the pest is native. B, the price of soybean in your country. C, the price of the most effective insecticide available. D, an effective way to sample pod borer larvae. And E, the number of female moths caught per night in a light trap. Well, let's consider each of those. How about the EIL used in India? If the pest is new to Africa or to your particular region, you probably haven't had time to develop an EIL or an, an economic threshold um, for pink pod borer in your region. So the best thing you may have to use, the best place to start may be with the EIL that's been used in various places in India. So A could be useful, especially in the early stages or the early um, years when this pest is being, is being combated. About the price of soybean in your country. Yes, that would be another uh, factor in which you would want to consider. Um, the EIL in India was used based on the price of soybeans in India and the soybean price can change. So the soybean price uh, in your country is important. If you'll recall the gain threshold, uh, the gain threshold was a ratio of the cost of application to the cost, uh, uh, to the price of that commodity. So the price of that commodity being soybean uh, would be relevant. And then I just gave away the answer to 
number uh, to C, the price of the most effective insecticide available. Again, that uh, the price of, of control insecticide in this case is part of that gain threshold that ties into the EIL. And so that would be a consideration. And then D, an effective way to sample pod bore larvae. This actually would not be part of the consideration in developing an EIL, but it would be very useful in implementing an IPM program for pod borer in your area. Um, you need to be able to sample effectively in order to determine the number of pod borer larvae uh, and whether they would be at an ET or, a, or, or, or at an economic threshold so that you could take action, uh, economic action to, to save the crop. And then finally, E, the number of female moths caught per night in a light trap. Um, this one, again, would not necess be necessary for developing an EIL for pod borer in your region, but it could be useful uh, in terms of developing sampling. Um, if, you could, if you could sample moths that were caught in a light trap, then you might know when the, when the, uh, when the moths are active, then you could expect uh, when to see the, the larvae uh, appearing in the field. And then you would, you would know when to uh, be able to sample, uh, start sampling for those, for those larvae. So no, it's not, not important for the EIL at this point, but it is important for overall, could be important for overall pest management. Okay, let's move on to scenario number two. Scenario number two, you have the option of using either a chemical insecticide that causes high mortality of armyworm in 24 hours or a microbial insecticide that achieves high mortality in about four days. Both are highly effective against armyworm and cost roughly the same price. So one of the questions would be, will the EIL of your management plan differ between the chemical insecticide and the microbial insecticide? And then second, will the ET or economic threshold of your management plan differ between chemical and microbial insecticide? Give you a minute to think about that. Okay, so let's, let's talk about first about whether the, uh, the EIL would, would differ between a, mic, uh, a microbial insecticide or a chemical insecticide if they uh, cost the same. Well, remember we relate the EIL back to the gain threshold. So the gain threshold is the cost of um, uh, chemical application to the value of the crop. And so if the cost of either the chemical or the microbial insecticide is the same, then that gain threshold will not differ between the, between the two. So in this case, uh, chemical and microbial insecticides will not, uh, will not affect the EIL. How about the uh, economic threshold of your management plan? Will that differ between chemical and microbial insect, uh, insecticides? And the answer to that is yes. And that's because uh, you need a little more lead time uh, for, uh, that's because the lead time for the chemical spray shown here in this, this graph in orange um, is much shorter than that for the microbial spray. So you don't need as much lead time for the chemical, whereas you need about three or four days or more for the um, microbial insecticide uh, to take effect uh, against armyworm. So you'd wanna give yourself more time for that microbial insecticide to work. So you're gonna have a lower economic threshold for the microbial insecticide than you would for the, the chemical insecticide as shown in this graph. Okay, and then finally, uh, we'll discuss a few defoliation scenarios. Um, defoliation sampling is a common method of estimating the need for pest management intervention. And defoli defoliation estimates are one of the sampling methods that are most prone to sampler error, however, and uh, they're often overestimated. We often think there's more defoliation out there in, in a soybean field than there actually is. Show you some examples of defoliation at the um, R6 or the uh, maturing uh, pod stage, full seed set of soybeans. You have three different uh, levels of uh, defoliation shown here. 
and just give you a minute to maybe estimate what what uh, what the percentage defoliation in each of those situations are from uh, for those three pictures. So what what do you see in the left? What do you see in the center? And what do you see in the right in terms of percentage defoliation? Okay, and, and here's what the actual uh, defoliation that was measured. Uh, shows on the left hand side six percent yeah it was uh it was low defoliation i might have said something more like 10 12 percent so i would have overestimated uh defoliation no it's not it's not high but there are some there are some places in that field where the the leaves are fairly heavily chewed but overall it's low so six percent the middle shows 15 percent um it's very easy for me to uh just take a a casual look at that slide and, and say it's probably more like 20% or perhaps even 25%. But when you actually measure that, it's only 15%. And that's because a lot of the damage is, is occurring in the, in the upper leaves. And there's still a lot of uh, leaves that are intact or have very low defoliation um, throughout the soybean canopy. And then when you look over at the right-hand slide, I think this is where um, you know, the error is most, most likely in estimating defoliation. This is only 35% defoliation, and that is, that is actually fairly substantial. But again, I think a casual look at this slide, or if you were to walk into a field and see this type of, of uh, defoliation, you would be quite alarmed, and you would tend to think it's probably more on the 40, 50, perhaps even 60% defoliation, when in fact, again, a lot of the defoliation is in the upper canopy. Um, there's very few instances in which entire leaves have been destroyed. So Overall, um, it's 35%, and I think it, it highlights an example where it's very uh, common to overestimate defoliation. So that set the stage, and I'm, I'm gonna give us a couple of uh, questions here, and I don't know whether we're gonna um, use a poll or we're gonna use the YouTube chat. We'll just kind of figure it out as we go here, but we've got a couple of scenarios where I'm gonna actually ask you to participate and estimate um, respond with your estimates of defoliation in a couple of uh, um, uh, pictures that I'll show you of, of soybean leaves being defoliated. We can use a poll, okay? We can use a poll. Okay. I think, Alina, you said something there. I didn't quite catch it. Yeah, we can use a poll just to give okay. you one minute. Okay, super, super. So we have a... We have a, a leaf here that's been artificially defoliated, um, but I'd like you to select the percentage of defoliation that most closely reflects that in the image. And let's see here. I'm not seeing where I can... I'm not seeing where I can do the poll, I'm sorry. Uh, oh no, I just I just put for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank yeah. you. Very fast rain, so. Excellent. I just so when I, I should close. Thank you. Yeah. So if you looked at this leaf here uh, and you were sampling a soybean field, then what percentage defoliation do you think it most closely reflects that in the image? Is it A 10%, B 20%, C 30%, or D 40%? You're getting to look at this very long and uh, have a lot of time to look at that. So I'm sure people get an opportunity to respond to the poll. But we're going to move on. Okay, so what did the poll say? Uh, Alina, can you, can you tell us? Yes, 10%, um, 26% uh, of the participant think, 20%, um, 29% of, of, uh, of the participant, and 30% or more, 45% of them that on this thing. Ah. So 30% more won. Yeah, yeah. So we had, we had quite the range there in terms of estimating. Um, it's what it sounds like to me. Is that correct? There's wide range of answers? Yes, 
the the thirty percent or more. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, good. But so a lot of people said we had a range of answers. I'll leave it at that. And but if we look at that, um, we had some that said twenty percent, and so that's what this. Uh, turns out to be, it's 20% defoliation on this leaf. So again, it's some points out some of the challenges in estimating uh, the percentage of, of defoliation and uh, good. Okay, we have one more, uh, which we'll use the pole on Alina. So um, here's one that's has more defoliation than the last, we'll put it that way. Mm. Okay, and we want you again to select the percentage defoliation that most closely reflects that in the image. Is it A, 44%, B, 54%, C, 64%, D, 74%. So again, if you'll respond to the poll and we'll let, uh, we'll let a few seconds go by and then uh, Alina can, uh, can let us know what, uh, what the range of responses are. Yeah, one minute, please. Mm -hmm. Sure. The pool is on. So you can start to answer, please. Okay. What what were the responses? Let's give them a little second more. I, mis I misunderstood you. No, sorry. <laughs> While well, we're waiting, I thought Doris did a great job in her presentation. And she especially was good at setting up some of the concepts in terms of insect damage, uh, whether that be from defoliators or you could use it in case of like spider mites. In these cases, how much uh, damage. It's, it's easier to see the spider mite damage, for instance, than it is to count those tiny little spider mites on the plant. And then again, she talked about things like pink pod borer and all that. So thank you, Doris, for sort of setting the table for my talk here. Yeah, I think we can end our pool. Sure. So, um, about the defoliation, uh, the majority of the participants to 74%, 35% of the voters okay. uh, were for this. 25% uh, to 64% of defoliation. 19% choose 44% and 19% choose 54% of the position. Okay. Well, we had a few people that got this right. Thank you for that, Elena. I appreciate you managing the polls for us. I think that really helps uh, engage with the audience out there. So I think you'll find the answer surprising and that is that the this is 44% defoliation, which again, you casually look at this leaf or you, you try to make an estimate in, in a fairly short amount of time. And um, yeah, it's easy, to, it's easy to say 54, 64, 74% defoliation. I think it illustrates very well <clears throat> that the um, uh, amount of defoliation tends to get overestimated, especially at higher levels of defoliation. This looks worse than it actually is. The defoliation appears worse than it actually is. And it, so it drives home the point that we're really prone to overestimating um, some measures of pest damage, particularly defoliation at high levels. So if you found that uh, interesting and useful, and uh, maybe you want to hone your skills, uh, you can practice your defoliation eye. Um, there's an interesting um, uh, website that I would suggest uh, I would recommend that you, that you could make you aware of that you could go to. It's put on by the Crop Protection Network and it uh, deals with the uh, Encyclopedia of Common Defoliators. And it has this uh, defoliation training tool, um, which I used uh, for a couple of the slides to illustrate um, uh, different levels of defoliation. So I'll leave that up there for a second if somebody wants to copy that down or take a photo and. Take a screenshot and
copy that. So that might be useful if you're involved in uh, estimating defoliation okay, as part of your pest management program. And then one other tool I'll make you aware of uh, that's becoming more and more common, and that is uh, the use of 3D uh, printers in order to uh, generate artificial leaves that can be used um, as tools, as extension tools. Um, I know there's some places in the United States that have, have made these and then distributed them to um, soybean pest management practitioners to soybean growers in their area. And again, it, it gives you, you're able to carry this to the field and uh, put that ring of uh, different levels of defoliation, defoliated leaves up to the, what you're seeing in the field. And so you can do it on site there. And as uh, 3D printers become cheaper and cheaper, the cost for, for producing these materials uh, becomes cheaper and cheaper as well. So. Something to think about and keep in mind um, for the future, and perhaps it's it's applicable to your program, or perhaps you know somebody uh, at one of the universities, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, um, that has uh, has produced these. This particular one was produced at um, the Ohio State University. So. Okay, so with that, I'll just summarize and say we cover direct and indirect pest damage relationships. We talked about the three P's of IPM, effective, economical, and ecologically sound. We then discussed concepts that underlie IPM in relation to the gain threshold, the economic injury level, economic threshold, and then the importance of sampling. And then uh, you're very gracious to participate in a few exercises um, for review and application. So thanks for your attention and uh, for attending today. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot. All right, yeah, thank you, Luis, for that great presentation. Uh, that was really informative. And so thanks very much for um, the excellent informative presentation, Luis. Um, so basically having a standardized tool to evaluate insect pest damage to help us decide when to have to control an insect pest is essential. And so it is good that we are able to understand the economic injury level and what is the economic threshold because that is actually what helps us to make decision regarding pest management. And so, uh, so as a reminder to our audience, please put any questions you have in the chat and you'll get them uh, uh, even after the presentation. So before we, we proceed to, um, uh, to, uh, to our question and answer session, we have our final poll that we want to, uh, to give us. And so I will ask Colleen to give us that final poll, and then we're going to go to the, uh, the Q&A session. So our poll is on, you can um, answer based on what you've listened from Louise's presentation. Okay, we're gonna end our poll soon. So if you guys want to vote, please do it now.
Okay, we're gonna end our pool. All right, thank you, Lynn, and thank you for answering. So I see that um, most of us got it correct, that um, it is false. So basically, um, that's why I actually mentioned in this presentation that it's best to take action slightly before or when the economic threshold has been breached to avoid the yield losses that will have negative economic consequences. Um, and so that is, uh, uh, it is good that you've been able to take action before, slightly before we get a lot of damage. And so this concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. And I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. Uh, Kurtz Legos and Dr. Hesler Louise for sharing their knowledge and experiences with the audience. I think I can speak for everyone when I say that we have certainly learned a lot during this webinar. And now we will be addressing audience questions in our Q&A session. And we will start with questions that are already in the chat, but feel free to continue adding any questions. And so I will hand it over to Michelle um, Santos, who is going to take us through the Q&A session. I will request uh, that our presenters turn on your camera so that you can be able to answer the questions as they come. Welcome, Michelle. Yeah, thank you very much, Haru, and thank you for the presenters, for the great um, uh, presentations. We learned a lot, I'm sure the, the people online too. Um, and it's really nice to see people from different parts of the world. We see from different countries in Africa, from India, uh, Brazil, Pakistan, the US. So really cool. So I'm going to manage the, the questions and the answers. So we have some questions that came up. So I will start with, a, actually, this one is not a question, it's a comment, but I think it's very pertinent. It's from Rosie. So Rosie is, now my questions start to, yeah. So she uh, she is mentioning that uh, we need a broken protocol so, so that we can know which strain is affecting the soybean and cowpea. Uh, I don't know if there's something, Doris, that uh, there is a protocol for identifying broken that we can provide it to the to the partners. Doris, you are muted. If you can, um. uh, well, I can't recall a protocol, but I just, you know, I learned from my experience is what we, when there was a trial evaluation in soybean and what the seeds were brought to, to um, the USDA, <clears throat> excuse me, lab. And so we have, we identified those, uh, the, the, uh, the 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 eggs and the larvae damage. So, you know, um, I think the most important is how you you uh, the manage in the field and how the opportunities you you give to the adults to to infest the fields before they go for the storage. But I can't recall a protocol really for um, blue kids. You know that I did some uh, work right, that, to identify these. Uh, uh, Brookings that you know uh, were no uh, cited before, but um, I really can provide more information more than the article that we published with Michelle Pawlowski. Yeah, there is something that uh, um, we can share also um, the the article with those that register and you get all the the materials. So that can be helpful as well. Thank you, Doris. So now we have a question for both of you. Uh, it's a question from Eliseu Vicente dos Santos. Uh, so Eliseu is from Brazil. He is saying, regarding green stinky bugs and brown marmorid stinky bugs, do you know project or viable solution? For example, cameras or sensors in order to map and practice site-specific spraying? Um, so uh, what I know, there are some research that have monitored, you know, by using cameras to see if uh, how the length or how the uh, sting bugs produce damage. Because for example, in the 
research that I'm conducting now or having progress is that, you know, I see, I did a no choice test and I see that uh, there are some PI, a PI that wasn't, it doesn't show the damage, but I, I don't know really if the, the steam bag wasn't attracted to it or it fit on it and the plant didn't respond to the toxic saliva. So yeah, there are, there are, uh, there are uh, some research in post plant resistance published from the uh, people in Ohio, um, the Ohio State University, um, but uh, chemical, I really can't recall. Maybe Lois has more information about it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't don't know the specifics, but I know, do know that at, um, the the sensing of, of uh, things like stink bugs uh, in the field, that's that's a up and coming um, research area, and so it's very likely that that would would happen in the future. Yeah, and in regard to Doris's uh, comment, there is there's at least a couple of places in which there is renewed interest in uh, host plant resistance, developing resistant varieties to stink bug. Um, and then also there's um, the ability perhaps to use um, earlier maturing varieties on um, which you avoid the stink bugs, which are typically more of a, tend to be a late season pest. So the earlier you can get your soybeans in and out, then there's some chances to avoid it. But specifically to the sampling question with using sensors and all that, I don't have an answer to that, but I do know that there's uh, quite a bit of research on it. And it's pretty exciting with some of the advances on with some of that. So. very much um, Doris and Louise. Let's go to another question. Um, Karen Sentry, uh, she is asking, as soybean farming increases in Africa, what do you predict will be the top pest problems considering current presence of the pest in regions in Africa, climate, cultural practice, etc. If you both feel free to, to chime in. Would you like to start, Doris, as you have your mic on? <laughs> and I was just thinking about, uh, it must be, you know, uh, the, um, so if we're thinking about climate change and you usually for hot environments, definitely no aphids because they like, you know, uh, higher than 28 Celsius more, they definitely don't develop that well. Um, it might be, you know, some beetles or moths that can easily be adapted because they in the uh, they are feeding behavior, you know. Uh, I can say the most affected can be the defoliators, you know, uh, leaf feeders and that might be affected, but um, I don't know what I, Louis might have other ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know either, but I would say in general, um, some things like um, spider mites are generally favored by warmer weather and the natural enemies of spider mites, a fungus that um, is often associated with them is disfavored by warmer, drier weather. Um, so um, spider mites would be one of the things I think not only in Africa, but in, in various regions where soybean, uh, soybean is grown, uh, they will be probably become a larger concern with, uh, with increasing uh, global temperatures. It's a lot, a lot to come and uh, to learn and manage. Thank you very much. Let me see, we have more questions. Um, exploring nature, of someone that uh, attended it with this name, are brown mammoth beetle in Africa? If yes, how, how can it be distinguished from other stink bugs? Um. So brown marmorated, still no in Africa. There are no records. I I search about it, but uh, you know, but there are they are very uh, easy to uh, to transport. They they can even go to heavy machin machineries like you know uh, autos transportation and stuff like that when they get moved to different countries and stuff. But, so that way they are probably gonna get there soon, you know, because it's well widespread. The way to, to distinguish brown marmorated is they in the antenna and legs they have wide segments. 
that is very distinct. I mean, I don't know if I can share a screen to, to show, but there are many, uh, I will say five, six species of sting bugs here in USA, but none of them look like a sting bugs. They are very, sting bugs, they are very distinct in the uh, coloration of the antenna in, uh, especially in the antenna. Thank you very much, Doris. Now we have a question for um, Louis Hessler. Um, how many seasons is, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna go back. It's a question for Leonid Moises. How many seasons of research you need to determine uh, EIL or ET? Yeah, thanks, that's a good question. Um, generally, in the research world, we'd, we'd like to get at least two years because years can be, one year can be different. One can be a, a, a dry, warm year. The next year might be a relatively mild and rainy or wet. So uh, we'd like to get a, a range of conditions in which the which we measure that relationship between pest abundance and yield loss. Um, also helps if you don't have, if you're not able to get two years, then it would also helped if you could do multiple sites in different geographic regions to kind of replicate those um, differences in environmental conditions. So if you could do some of the research in a uh, in a drier uh, area that gets less rainfall, and you could also do that in a, a, a region that's uh, wetter, maybe cooler temperatures, and then you know a couple in each of those areas. So maybe you have a, a range of uh, locations or sites of soybeans with, within a year, that might be sufficient. And if you could repeat it a second year, then that would certainly be great. But we generally think two years just to just to see how conditions vary from year to year. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have time to address one more question. There is a question from George Odumbe. What do you make of the regener there we go. regenerative egg practices like no tillage and ground covers in terms of the influencing insect pest pressure on crops? Do you think there can be a relationship between the two? So I don't know, Dori, do you want to start with it? I'm going to let Louis talk. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, that's that's a, another good question. It's another, uh, or it's a good example of where um, certain conditions can can affect pest abundance, and then of course pest abundance affects uh, that relationship with yield loss. And the yield loss is not necessarily the same under those different um, um, cropping approaches, those uh, different cropping systems. Um, Again, I said in my, my presentation that there's, in many instances, we don't have economic injury levels or economic thresholds for particular pests in soybeans. But in some, some cases we do, but we might wanna re-examine some of those in light of changing um, agronomic and uh, you know, cropping practices that have come on in the last few years, such as no-till, such as other things um, in terms of weed management and whatnot that we emphasize with regenerative agriculture and other, other forms of sustainable um, ag practices. Those can affect uh, various components of the agro ecosystem. So that can affect the pest, but it can also affect uh, you know, the, the timing of when the pest comes in. It can affect uh, levels of natural enemies associated with that pest. And so um, yeah, that, that's, it's, it's, uh, those are definitely some things to consider, some factors to consider in, in developing an EIL and ET would be things like um, tillage would be a very, very big one in, in many instances. And then again, even if those are, have been established, you may want to reconsider or see if they're equally applicable in, in different tillage systems or different types of um, cropping systems. Good question. So nice to see very nice questions coming, people interacting. Yeah, bring your questions. You know, we have only two minutes and I think we had something else. Let me double check here. Okay, it's, um, 
maybe there's going to be the last questions, but the last question we'll be able to answer here. But if you have more questions, please feel free to bring it to the question and answer section. And we will make sure to send you the answer afterward through email. We have your email and we will address every one question. So the last question is from Marisha Eager from Ethiopia. Um, currently, soybean storage pest brooked is very um, challenging in Ethiopia. Is there any recommended management regarding such pest? We would like to start. Or if you would like to chime in, or Doris, feel free. Well, um about different type of control, I will say more preventive, especially for soybeans, uh, is the <laughs> harvest time. You know, although, like I say, the success for many of these uh, soybean threats uh, are are like uh, their uh, ability to not only feed on soybeans but other plants as well. So people have to, you know, look look. Uh, Think about broader about how they manage their crops and how they they uh, uh, include this uh, feeding behavior of the adults and how they you know progress and, and damage and storage process. Um, about other type of control, maybe Louis knows more. Yeah, sure. I and I can't claim that I do know a whole lot about this particular pest, but. Um... One thing that's in, it, it's I sense a, a lot of interest in this. This is our second or third question about brookets and soybeans, and so there's definitely some interest and concern out there. Um, Doris mentioned some things that could be done in the field. I also think that once the soybeans are harvested, it'd be I don't know the extent to which this is done, but it it would certainly be interesting to take sampled soybeans, for instance, in a in a in a in a wagon or in a truck or something or, or at the storage facility and to actually apply, I in my presentation, I talked about applying um, sampling and economic considerations in the field. But once the soybeans have been harvested and they're out of the field, I think that's also another situation in which you could apply the same principles of sampling and economic considerations. And you'd have to develop a, a protocol or whatever of looking at, um, of taking, samples of that harvested soybean grain, soybean seeds, and um, checking those for brookets, develop a sampling plan for those and decide at that point, now that the soybeans are out of the field, what's, what are viable pest management strategies that make economic sense? So like I said, even though I talked about them in the field, that, that component where the, the, the soybeans and potentially the brookets pests are outside of the field and in the harvested soybeans is a whole nother consideration, but it's equally, I think it's equally applicable in present, preventing um, pest damage in um, soybean storage facilities. So something to think about there, another, another good question. Thank you very much, Dr. Doris and Dr. Luis. Um, so we, um, Marisha also, we got your question about the rust and how long is gonna uh, reach out to you and answer that one directly. Um, and for now, I think how do I you uh, pass back to you? And once again, I would like to the speakers, Dr. Lo um, Doris Lagos Kutz and Dr. Louis Hessler. We learned a lot from you today. I appreciate this of innovation. I appreciate your availability to, to attend and present in this webinar. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for the Q&A session. And thank you, presenters, for your time to answer this question. So in case we are not able to get some of your questions, we will uh, be able to answer them. We will send them to our presenters. They will attend to them. And then we will share through our um, email. And I'll be able to uh, post this email later on in as, as we come to the end. So we will be able to answer in the best way possible. So once again, a big thank you to our presenters. We have reached the end of our webinar. And we hope today's webinar on identifying common soybean insect pests in Africa and quantifying economic thresholds for insect pest damage strengthened your soybean pest insect identification abilities and gave you a greater confidence when evaluating pest damage levels. So uh, this is this was our first webinar in uh, Soybean Innovation Labs two-part webinar series. 
Uh, so we're going to also host another uh, uh, session or uh, series two, which is coming up in October, I think the last week of October. And in this second series, you'll be looking at um, how to do scouting for, DC, uh, for pests uh, on soybeans and also explore the management practices that, uh, that are being utilized to manage these pests and diseases. So we uh, hope that you, you'll be able to keep an eye on this. And we would like to also highlight that we have the SEAL University Integrated Pest Management Training Courses. These are free online training course that provides in-depth information on and identifying and managing variety of pests, including insect pest, and is an excellent source for researchers, field managers, and farmers all alike. So um, Aline will be sharing the link to the course in the chat, and you can also access the course through the Soybean Innovation Lab Tropical Soybean Portal. So, so we do have that. We do have the, 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 the course. You can be able to access it. And uh, we want to really thank you all for joining us today. So thank you for coming. We hope you enjoyed this first webinar in our series on scouting, identification, and management of soybean pests in Africa. And we will email the recording and materials shortly. And you feel free to share them with whomever may be interested. So thank you very much for joining, joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. So we want to wish you an excellent uh, rest of your day.